topicality of counterplans or anything like that unless the other team brings it up. Why is that a really good strategy if you're negative and running stop for counterplan? No, 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 no. There's a much better reason than that. If I run a topical counterplan, let's say I'm debating one of the uh, some classic, classic old school traditional team in my region, and the, I know from the get-go that they oppose topical counterplan, and that when I run a topical counterplan, they're going to get up and whine about it for the next 13 minutes. <laughs> Why is it a fantastic idea for me to not mention it in the one and two? Because they're going to be the ones that see the irrational videos. Yes, they're going to get up and start talking about all this crazy debate theory stuff and how terribly unfair I am for talking about reality. <laughs> and uh, it's fantastic. So yes, if you run a topical counterplan, especially if you know the other team hates them, don't mention it in the one and C. You have no reason to justify it. Give them a genteel option. Give them an out and allow them to choose not to contest your theory on that point. It's nice of you. And if they make the wrong choice, it's even more glorious. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. Um, so your mutual exclusivity here comes in the reasons to prefer that you solve your harm but avoid the dissent. Yes. Yep. By the way, this is genius. Like, counterplans, like in my club, were explained like arguments for and against B. It was like super vague and nonsensical. That is awesome. Yeah, the, I think this structure is really, really simple. And even if even if you're running a time frame counterplan or different things like that, it's generally going to follow this this structure. But instead of disadvantages, it'll be something more specific to the timing or the agent or the actor. Maybe it's a DA against those. But the structure will be really, really similar. Who knows what an implied counterplan is? Yeah, Chris. Ex Okay, Jared? What do you mean by hypothetical counterplan? Just like, what, what if we could do this? Okay, yeah, here, here's how I'd explain implied counterplans, is where you say, here are three other things that we could do that we're not going to be able to do because of the affirmative team's case. Just at its core, so very similar to what you guys are saying. I'm pretty sure that's what you mean by hypothetical counterplan. But understand that an implied counterplan, which we'll be talking about right here, isn't actually something that you have a mandate for or a text for that if you vote for the negative team, you're going to pass. Okay? That's not what an implied counterplan is. Yeah, JP. Cool. I'll talk about that in one second. Okay. After I explain it, let me talk about how to deal with it in rounds when you get teams who do that. Yeah, Madeline. We've had teams that run in like, like in implied counterplans in their first speech. They run it as an opportunity pass DA, and then their second negative speech, or even the rebuttal, they turn it into an actual counterplan. They're like, well, you didn't respond to our counterplan, so we just should vote for our plan yeah. to get passed instead of that. Yeah, that, that, that's a little sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so let's just explain implied counterplans really quick. So let's just say the affirmative team's case is to abolish the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, okay? Let's just go with something like that. If your case is to abolish the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, what are all the things that you miss out on? <laughs> Human rights, okay. Okay, yeah, Gabe. Okay, so you miss out on reforming the Human Rights Council when you abolish it. Sweet. Anything else? I mean, that, that's the answer I was looking for. So we'll just stop right there. So, so when you abolish the Human Rights Council, you can't reform it because it's no longer there. Okay? So my partner and I's strategy against the case to abolish the Human Rights Council was we would say, in order to show that the Human Rights Council should be abolished, you have to show that it's beyond repair, that it just can't be fixed in whatever, and reformed in this, that, and the other way in order to actually be effective at promoting human rights. And so we said, 
we, we followed this structure right here. We said the affirmative team's burden is that they have to prove the ideal solution. Couple reasons for that. We said, first off, you have theoretically infinite prep time. And that for, since the resolution was announced to this date at this tournament, you have had all of that time to pick your case. Okay, so you got to pick the topic matter, you got to pick your case, and when you choose a specific area, you should be held to the standard of showing that your solution is the ideal solution and the best solution to that problem. Okay? Then we said our burden is to show that their case isn't the ideal solution, that there's other options that are better. Okay? And so here's what we'd say with regards to the Human Rights Council. We'd say reforming the Human Rights Council, if it's possible, would be better than simply abolishing it. And so we listed out six different reforms that you could do. And we said, if you're convinced that at the end of the day, the Human Rights Council could be reformed instead of being abolished, then you should vote for us. Because once you abolish it, you can no longer reform it. Okay? So that's what we're talking about there. But your impact is opportunity cost, where you basically say, when you do this policy, you miss out on the chance of doing all of these policies. So for marine natural resource, there, there was a team that I was coaching who went from NCFCA, didn't do a STOA tournament, STOA policy tournament the whole year, they went to NITOC. And beforehand we prepped them out this giant opportunity cost DA. They, I think they ran it probably every round. I don't know how many times they actually ended up using it. But it basically said, when you do, in marine natural, pol, marine natural resources, here are the three big issues. They were like oil, this, and this. And so any case that wasn't dealing with those things, they would run this opportunity cost DA. And they'd say, these are the really big issues. Here's what your case is dealing with. And so when you pass a case like that, which is dealing with some tiny area of marine natural resource, you lose out on all of the political capital and all of the pressure from the people to make a real change with regards to marine natural resources. And we said, here are all these other policies that we could do that are more important that we can't do because you've expended time, effort, money, and political capital to pass some dinky plan dealing with marine natural resources that no one knows about. Okay? Does that make sense, kind of in that structure? And so all of those other things that we said, these are the things that you could do, those were our implied counter plans. Those are the things we were saying, here are all of the options that we could do that you're missing out on by passing the affirmative team's case. Yes, Alman? But does that directly refute the affirmative team's case? Yes. It does in that when you do their case, you can't do the rest of them. They're not going to happen. Does that make sense? So when you abolish the Human Rights Council, you can't reform it, kind of a thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's generally how you run it. Yeah, Hannah. Okay. Um, and it was so easy to do. We spent their entire negative block just pounding that issue, and we just brought it back to the plan, to our plan, and they lost every single round. So I don't want to see sort of like a I see implied counterplans. These are what my partner and I ran against a ton of cases my last year. So I see them as being particularly effective, but only if you structure them right. Generally, just the whole opportunity cost thing isn't the best in my opinion. What makes it stronger is if you couple it with something like reforming, not abolishing something. So that's, that's when we ran implied counterplans against the most. So my last year was dealing with the United Nations. We had cases that were like abolishing the International Monetary Fund, abolishing the Human Rights Council, abolishing this, that, and the other thing. And so we'd say, look, if you're going to abolish something, you have to show that it's beyond reform and that any reform can't make it better, kind of a thing. So we implied like six different reforms that could fix the problem. And that's how we went about it, which I feel like is more applicable to exactly their case than it seems like the immigration political capital thing was. So if you're going to run implied counterplans, make sure they're applicable and specific to the area that you're dealing with, not some generic thing. Yeah, Madeline. Yeah. JP.
the negative is not running this counter plan when you should vote against them, which was, I think, a dumb argument, but the judge bought it and voted against us. Okay, so let me talk about yours in one second once I get these, once I get these other questions. Yeah. Masking the root of the problem is a really good link for implied counterplans. Oh, okay. Let's go back to JP's question. The whole, the affirmative team gets up and says, so are you advocating this or not kind of a thing. So first off, let's respond to the last question which you asked, which was them getting up and saying, well, then why aren't you running it as a counterplan if you truly believe it? It's a misunderstanding of what the negative burden is. You have to establish that your burden as the negative is to show the affirmative team's case isn't the ideal solution. Okay? Given their theoretically infinite prep time, given their ability to select the specific area under the resolution and the specific case under it, they have the burden to show that their solution is the ideal solution. Because they could choose from all of the different policy areas, all the different policy choices, and they chose this one. So when you explain it like that, then their whole, then why aren't you running your counterplan thing doesn't stand up. Because that's not your job to, to propose a better solution necessarily if you're running implied counterplans. It's not your job to say that this solution is better. It's your job to show that their case isn't the ideal solution kind of a thing. Okay? So that's one way you could go about explaining that. And then your argument, well, what was the first point you talked about, which is you got up and asked, are you running this as a Basically, counterplan? The, both were about the same case. Okay. So Yes, yes and no. Be specific when you run implied counterplans, okay? Don't just be like, look, there could be possibly better solutions out there that we haven't fully researched that might be out there that are better kind of a thing. And you don't get those with your plan. 